Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Soul Medication. This is Michelle, your host, and today we are going to continue looking at Old Testament scriptures that are foretelling the Messiah. And today we're looking at Psalm 72, verses 10 to 11. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. So there's a a man, Derek Kidner, and he wrote in one of the commentaries, the New Testament nowhere quotes this passage as messianic, but this picture of the king and his realm is so close to the prophecies of Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 60 to 62 that if those passages are considered messianic, then so is this. So that was his um, comment on this. That's why I kind of chose this because I liked the fact, I think of when I read this, uh, Psalm, these two verses, uh, you've got the king, uh, kings of Tarshish and the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. And all I can think of is we three kings. So um, I think it's uh, very appropriate to pull this in today. Now let's look at the background. In the beginning of what is believed to be a Psalm of Solomon or for Solomon, there's a little bit of some little bit of controversy there. He prays for wisdom to rule, to judge And he is requesting the spirit of God's righteousness to control all his actions. He wants to do the right thing. And he has every intention to rule with righteousness and to bring justice to the poor. May they fear you while the sun endures as long as the moon throughout is is throughout all generations. And here in verse five, we see that Solomon or whoever's praying this prayer acknowledges that by answering this prayer, the people will have a reverence of God through all the generations on earth. In verse six, he says, may Solomon be like rain on fresh mown grass, refreshing water, watering it, providing the right environment for growth and health. In verse 7, we see, In Christ's days shall the uncompromisingly righteous flourish, and peace abound till there is a moon no longer. The writer is now talking about the Messiah. In verse 8, Christ will have dominion also from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. There, This is a universal kingdom far exceeding Solomon's reign. In verse 9, Those who dwell in the darkness shall bow before him, I'm sorry, those who dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Anyone who chooses to be an enemy of the Lord should be prepared to be defeated. And we see that all the kings will fall down to him. Such a promise that sometimes just bearing my human side of my soul and the human nature in me, it seems frustrating that you follow the Lord and it just seems like sometimes you get into this thing, this pattern where things just are not going your way and you see the evil in the world triumphing. And I think that sometimes it's good when I feel some hope when I see in God's word, tell me that those who dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall like the dust. That means that their day is coming that we need to continue to be steadfast in our path because their day is coming and anyone who chooses to be an enemy of the Lord should be prepared to be defeated. And I think more so than having a fear of a bad outcome, we need to have the hope that Jesus brings and the hope for a good outcome. In verse 10, we see the kings of of Tarshish. Now this could have been Spain. And then of the coast from the distant shores all these other kings shall bring their offerings the kings of sheba which is the modern day yemen an african nation of seba shall offer gifts basically what they're saying is from the ends of the earth that the jewish nation knew of the kings will pay their respects and in verse 17 solomon writes men shall be blessed in him All nations shall call him blessed. And he recognizes that not only 
is this Messiah fulfilling the prophets, prophecy as and promise that was made to David in 2 Samuel, but there is also the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12 about in all in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Spurgeon says Christ is of all blessing. When you have written down his name, you've pointed to the fountain from which all blessings flow. This is the prophecy of hope. This is not a kingdom which is set up through the church, but this is the Messiah ruling. He's at the center of the promise, the signs, the hope, the prophecy, the one who gets all the glory, not coming to serve this time and much more not having a place to lay his head. He now possesses a universal kingdom with dominion, all power and all authority. His kingdom is personal and it will last forever. Spurgeon also wrote, personal pronouns referring to our great king are constantly occurring in the psalm, and this points to the personal rule and reign. He has dominion. Kings fall down before him and serve him, for he delivers, he spares, he saves, he lives, and daily is he praised. When we read the next couple verses, we see, Blessed be the Lord God of the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. When Solomon reflects on the promise of the Messiah, we see that he is moved to this doxology of praise. He blesses the Lord, the God of Israel. I think that in studying the desolation of Jerusalem and and how they went so long without a king and a leader and they were taken into captivity and bondage time and time again because of their idolatry and their worshiping of other gods and their mingling with the people of other nations who worshiped other gods, which caused them to sin. When I look at the hope and the promises that were laid out about Jesus coming to earth to bridge this gap. When I think about that, it gives me more joy. And I think that as you know, Solomon prayed for wisdom, and as he reflects on the promise of the Messiah, he's moved to this doxology of praise. And I think that as we, as believers, reflect on this time of year, there's some believers that say, well, I'm not celebrating Christmas because we don't know when Jesus came to earth. And I think that Christmas should not be commercial. And I agree, Christmas should not be a commercial thing. But I think there's a huge party that should be held here. And that actually, you know, yeah, we could extend it to every day of the year. But we have this Christmas time that believers can stand up and say, praise be to God, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. And amen. So be it. Spurgeon also wrote, we pray that the atheist, the blasphemer, the hardened rebel, the prodigal, we have none of those around today, right? We pray that these may each be filled with God's glory. And then we ask for mercy for the whole earth. We leave not out so much as one, but so hope and expect the day when all mankind shall bow at the Savior's feet. I love Spurgeon's passion for the gospel and for other people to get it. And I need to pray more for forgiveness, for not praying and believing that I should be praying for all people. Sometimes I see the evil in the world and I just, I'm so defeated by Satan. And I think there's no way that this person will ever come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Am I alone here? Am I the only one that thinks that? But when we pray, as Spurgeon says, we should pray for the whole earth because we know that every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. And more than that, every human, every people was made and is an image of Christ, made in the image of Christ, created by the creator. I know that there have been times when I thought, hmm, can't wait till that person has to bow to Jesus. I know, right? 
I'm really so glad that I have a savior because without him, I have no idea where my thought life would be. But as I continue to renew my mind in the word and go back daily, daily renewing my mind, continuing to become more and more like Jesus, I think more along the lines of, Lord, I lift this person up in my heart. I have no idea what's going on in their life to make them behave like this. I don't know why they're lashing out like this. I don't understand. But you, Lord, you created them. You know what's going on. And I pray first for the heart to pray for his salvation, to pray for the salvation of that person. Lord, forgive me for not seeing this person as you see them. Forgive me for not seeing this person as being made in the very image of God also. I pray, Lord, that you would put people in their path to share your love and the gospel with him. And if that's me, then let me do that. Give me the boldness to do that. But even more than that, reveal your salvation to him today. Don't let them miss out on being in glory with you forever. Have mercy on them today, Lord. And as we read this psalm, if you've been following along with me these past two weeks, we just get this wonderful promise filled with hope again. But then we also know, like we, like I mentioned, how long they've been waiting for the Messiah, how long they've been desolate, they've been laid bare, and they've been spread out in the captivity and bondage without a king because of their sin, their evil, their love for other gods, for not following God. What a huge black hole of disappointment. For in about five years time from the time when with the glorified wealth of Solomon to being attacked by King Shishak of Egypt, who came and he took away all the treasures of the house for the Lord and of the king's house, he took away all, including all the shields of gold, which Solomon had made, and he left bronze ones in their place. And each day we look at the Old Testament scriptures and I see the despair that the Jewish nation must have felt. And this makes me see the promise of the Messiah all the more exciting to the point that I was at church this week singing Angels We've Heard on High. And as we sang that second verse, I just wanted to jump and shout and sing. And I just wanted to scream, people, don't you get it? Don't you get this song? Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? Say, what may the tidings be which inspire your heavenly song? I can imagine being one of the shepherds. I can, I, I would be thinking and saying to the angels, why the jubilee? Why are you singing your joyous chorus, your joyous song over and over? What can you possibly be singing about? Don't you know there's nothing to be joyful about? We're no longer a people. But the angels sang, come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come and door on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn king, because God made a promise. And just as we've been learning, he delivered that promise. And the shepherds went because the angels sang. The angels did not give them a watered down secret code message. They said, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all people. For to you is born this day in the town of David a Savior, who is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. Here is the fulfillment of the prophecy. God fulfills what he promises. What has God promised you? I want to encourage you to spend your Selah moments today thinking about his promises. I'm pretty sure he does not promise we will never hurt, fall, mess up. But I do think that there are some awesome promises that help us through pain, knowing he comforts us. He binds up our wounds and heals the brokenhearted. Each time we fall, he does not cast us down, but he holds us up each time with his hand. When we mess up, we know that his mercies are new every morning and he is faithful even when we are not faithful. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Maybe you are afraid of something today. Maybe you are totally in despair about something today. Maybe you need to be strengthened and you need to be upheld. Here's your sign. You will keep you 
you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Isaiah 26, 3 gives you that promise. Maybe you need that perfect peace. Maybe you need that promise. Maybe God is asking you to trust me. Just trust me, he says. I know he's been doing that to me. Just trust me, have faith, continue to follow me. Well, I know that he is going to keep me in perfect peace. And I may need to go back to that a couple times throughout the day, but I know that God is going to keep me in perfect peace because my mind is steadfast. My mind is stayed on him. Guaranteed, if your mind is stayed on the world, you're going to be seeking some more peace. In Deuteronomy 31, 8, it says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Huge promise to the omnipresence of our Lord and God that he is everywhere. He transcends time. If you're worried about an appointment this afternoon, know that he transcends time. He's already there. He's been there. He's with you the whole way. He can be there this minute and he is with you this minute. He goes before you. He's going to be with you. Maybe you need that promise today. And here, Jesus even tells us life will be hard in John 16, 33. Where are the people that, that say when you're struggling, you're struggling so hard and people are like, oh, just trust God. It'll get easier. It doesn't get easier. I've told you these things, John says, Jesus is saying in John, that so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Know that Jesus is with you in your trouble, that he goes before you, that he's there, that you, when your mind is stayed on him, that he keeps you in perfect peace and take heart because he's overcome the world. Maybe you need that promise today. Meditate on those promises today and others that you find. Promises that are there because we have a relationship with Jesus, not because Jesus promises that we'll have this easy life, but because we have a relationship with him, the Messiah, the delivered promise of God to bridge the gap that we would have otherwise had and been lost for eternity. I hope that they these verses encourage your heart today. Hide his word there in your heart. And I hope to see you again here tomorrow for another dose of soul medication.